This is a jar of cannabis tincture. 100, 160 proof Everclear sat in a gallon or a half gallon jug and put an eyedropper full of that under my tongue. Mm -hmm. And 20 minutes later, I sit there in the chair reading or whatever. 20 minutes later, I get up and I'm almost pain free. But that was my first wife. My second wife was uh, a lady that I met who was my hiking partner for all the 4,000 footers in the state of Maine. That was what kept us together. She was a, she was a mountain climber. Uh, once we climbed all the mountains, we had nothing nothing in common. That is a that's a 20 pound bag of last year's potatoes. Where you meet most of the ladies you dances. Uh, I've met, except for one. Uh, so yes, I'm an environmentalist. I'm a uh, waste minimization specialist, is the title I use. And uh, uh, I get very much involved in not throwing stuff away. Curling of the vest is gonna go. And so I've been, I've been manually uncurling it. It's all the same with you, I'm gonna take my glasses off. Good afternoon, I'm Harold Ant, uh, otherwise known as Captain Harold Ant by some. Um, but uh, I live here in Freeport and uh, we're uh, gonna have some fun today. I'm very happy that you uh, uh, approached me because of uh, the project that I've been doing for 30 years, uh, building a, a boat, 113 feet long, uh, one of the largest boats in the state of Maine once it's launched. But uh, I've been, like I said, 30 years building it. It's built as a demonstration of what can be built out of what other people have thrown away or would have thrown away. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization behind it, and uh, it uh, has a very, very interesting history, which uh, I'm pleased to uh, put you in contact with. Just, just so that I know that that's where you're at. It, it looks like a uh, uh, seat's down both sides. Yes. And then there's a, there's a hole in the floor and there's a, uh, there's a ladder on that hole. Yeah. Okay, right. okay. Um, so I'm going, I'm going up to the pilot house now. Well, let me, let me just quickly give you a tour right there. I don't, have, have you looked down below? Okay, but you're inside. The, you're inside the salon cabin itself. Yeah, the part in the middle. Okay, what that's designed so there's a, just so that you know, there's a there's a, a companion way way forward that goes down into the forecastle, and then that big hole that you're standing inside of, uh, that goes down into what will be the galley and the beginning of all of the accommodations. The galley in that thing is the full width of the ship. It's a, it's a restaurant galley.
if you're standing for, looking forward to your left, there's a little bench and there's a dumb waiter that will come from the galley below up through and feed the, feed the people all seated in that, uh, in that salon area. So the, there won't be a lot of putting soup up through the, the companion way and dumping it over your head and that sort of thing. Are you there? I bet the ship cut him off. Yeah. A sign at both ends of town that says welcome to Freeport that's a silhouette that they just came up with from somewhere I don't know where years and years and years ago and yet they're and they don't have a boat like that in the harbor they could have had one they still can but uh, they're trying they're trying their best to, to stop me from ever getting it built calling it a boat, but it's not a boat, it's a ship. It's a great big ship. A three-masted schooner. Have you been in it? Gigantic! Harold came up with a dream to build a canoe in his garage. The canoe got a little big. Financially, this is the worst nightmare I could have, but I, I get nothing if I don't keep going. So, Harold's a character. He's, a, he's an amazing man. I mean, his, if you know his history on the coast of Maine, it's, it's really kind of impressive. It is to me. I've uh, well, released today a program which has uh, 40 to 50 points aimed at uh, dealing with air pollution, water pollution, noise pollution, solid waste, and so on. These are the kinds of things that we need to roll back pollution. Tough language, tough rhetoric is not going to do the job. Well, Bath Iron Works is Maine's largest employer. We presently have uh, 11,500 people on the payroll. Today, you're a guy building a boat in your backyard. The next day, nope, you're a nonprofit now. You can't do that. There's a guy's being steamrolled and he's being steamrolled by people who have access to money and power because they know how to play the game. I think people are more worried about the scrap material left behind. Some sort of hoarding was going on to get materials for the boat or just to get materials, I don't know. People outside of this immediate neighborhood are more concerned about the launch. I think that the boat will go in the water and sit for another 20 years. To build a boat as big as I wanted to build, I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I could afford it would be to buy uh, Navy scrap or 
industry scrap. Yeah. So the whole boat is built out of um, Navy uh, high density um, scrap. Admiral Zumo was my boss in Vietnam, and we became friends and we corresponded throughout his life. His son got Agent Orange and died from cancer from the Agent Orange. If it hadn't been a Zumo uh, backed by the chief, of, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Moore, the Navy never would have changed. It takes it takes a special person to put up with the punishment of being a change agent. My name is Bill Peterson. I'm a naval architect. Uh, welcome to my home. This is the home where I was born uh, many years ago, and I also have an office here because I'm a naval architect and uh, design ships. And we're here to talk about the project in Freeport, South Freeport, that Harold Arndt has been working on for many years. So this was the design, and it was rendered for me by a wonderful guy at VIW that used to work for me, named Jim Stilton. But this, you can see, has a Japanese flag in it and the romantic uh, figures looking out. Uh, this inspired Harold. Uh, when Harold uh, came to me, I was concerned that he would do something so big. But in his mind, it may not even have been big enough. His dreams were, were that type. And in looking at a drawing, the drawings of a boat, you envision what the big picture would be and then try to put the little details together. Uh, the that reason that's important is you have to come up with a shape that c takes everything you want to put inside of it, what this is called the arrangement. Mm -hmm. These are called the lines, so you can actually create this vessel. And then this is the sail plan that shows you where the sails would be how they can be broken up and managed for rough weather or light weather sailing, and how the basic functions of a ship are accomplished. We call it form, fit, and function. And the function of this boat was to take people to sea and teach them about the ocean. He wanted to do research, he wanted to educate them. Is the lines plan. And embedded in this lines plan, which Harold then took and drew full size. Harold had to take all of the offsets in a table of offsets because there were hundreds of numbers and lay them out on the floor so he could draw these full size from which to make his frames and his molds to then put longitudinals, floor timbers in, and then eventually weld plating on it. All right, it's the beginning of the real thing. He's so brilliant. He's, he's a brilliant man. He makes these inventions all the time, but he doesn't, he doesn't pattern. When he was building his, his uh, three-masted schooner in his backyard, he taught himself welding. And then he made, he made the instruments that would help him bend metal. So when I first met Harold, this was in the late 1990s, um, as, a, as a writer and editor at Ocean Navigator, um, he gives me directions to the site and um, I pull in and it's like this, you know, you, you come in through the pines and then suddenly it opens up and his dad, who was in his early 70s, Chris, was the crane operator, and he was sitting there in the little, in the little 
you know, cabin thing operating the crane. And then Harold with his vest and he was really sort of energetic and sprightly. He'd be hopping around on the ship. And it was at that point, the keel had been laid and there were a number of frames that had been welded into place, but they were basically just welding, creating, welding up these frames. And then, the, and then Chris would sort of maneuver them into place. Harold would brace them, level them, and then he'd weld them into place. And he had this kind of, you know, animism that he was so excited about what he was doing that it was, it was magnetic, but it was also, I mean, he was a, I mean, he is, was an iconoclast, like somebody who just has this vision about what he wants to do. And, but it didn't take a genius to kind of look around the woods, like, you know, in the middle of the woods. My name is Twain Braden and I'm a partner at a law firm in Portland called Thompson Bowie and Hatch. And uh, the kind of work I do is what's called Admiralty and Maritime Law. It's really anything to do with salt water and ships, boats, accidents, collisions, injuries, contracts that go wrong, any number of ways that people come to hurt on the ocean. Um, I'm Fred Reeder. Um, I've been in Maine since 1986. Actually, 85, I started working for the town in 1986. Worked for the town for 31 years as the code enforcement officer. Uh, I've been retired for three years. Actually, even before 1986, uh, Harold Arndt started building a project for his own. Uh, it was a large steel boat. Um, or maybe better call a ship, I'm not sure. But he was doing it as a home occupation, which was perfectly permissible. Uh, he owned a lot of land uh, down on McCoy Drive. Uh, at that time, most of the homes down there were small cottages, seasonal cottages. And uh, so there were no issues for years. Um, he worked on this boat, collected materials. Uh, I think he used to work at Bath Iron Works, was able to get a lot of reject materials from them, store it on his property. Uh, but over the years, uh, the cottages started to sell. People started building bigger, more expensive homes, you know, get on the waterfront in, uh, in Maine. And small problems would come up with noise, uh, people's concerns about Oh, fires, things like that, but nothing too serious. Uh, the fire chief would go down and look at it every once in a while. I would go down and look at it every once in a while. Things went on for years. Uh, then Harold did an interesting thing. Um, he created the Island Rover Foundation, which separated one of these lots off from his home lot and created the foundation. Um, and this was all done unbeknownst to most people. But then he came to the town uh, to the uh, assessment review board because he wanted to get his taxes reassessed. That's when it first came to our attention. Uh, wait a minute. Um, since it's not connected to his property any longer, uh, it's no longer a home occupation. So it became uh, pretty much a, a commercial enterprise, which was not permitted in that area. So my name is Albert Presgraves. I was the town engineer and public works director in Freeport until I retired in 2016. And I had been there 13 years. Um, Harold was asked by the town to, um, well, let's see, you know, again, I don't know exactly what the, the details of this are, but my understanding is he was not formally in violation of any zoning thing when he was building that boat on his own private property for his own private use. But then he decided, I'll, I'll say, to s start a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. And when he did that, from some legal zoning standpoint, he became illegal. He's a genius. Okay, and he's but he's a creative genius. He he's not a planner, and I don't. I think he did. He'd admit that he's not a boatyard. He's not Bath Ironworks. He didn't go step by step according to a plan to build a ninety foot steel vessel, and he thought success at each step would lead to launching and making use of the vessel. Mm -hmm. 
and I and he's run into real issues. So fast forward 20 years, um, and I had no idea certainly 20 years ago that I would one day become his lawyer. Um, but by the time that happened and I became his lawyer, it was, it was a genuine clusterfuck. I mean, total shit show between him and the neighbors, the town council. Um, he'd been not only sued, but also entered into a consent agreement that then had expired and he'd been sued on the consent agreement. So there was like a lawsuit upon a lawsuit. And so it was a, it was a mess legally, politically, everything it was a total mess by the time I'd reacquainted with him. And, you know, and Harold to his credit, he still had that fire, but it had been clear that he could no longer raise money to further the cause. So the project itself had ground to a screeching halt and had been bogged down for years by the time I got involved. Carter Becker, been in Freeport 30 years, something in that nature. Falls Point Marine for 25, Marine construction, mm -hmm. contractor, lifetime waterman, sailor, racer, from a very competitive family, Olympic, Olympic sailors to uh, solo sailors out to Bermuda and back. So. Grew up on a 36 foot classic wooden 1925 sailboat cruising the coast. So I avoided it for 10 years. I knew it was happening in the woods. It didn't bother me, it didn't disturb me. I knew this guy was in the woods building his boat. And then I was doing a project across the street from his house and he came down and uh, cornered me to come look at the project. That was Harold, and I was building a seawall across the street from his house. And from there, he intrigued me with one part of it, move the boat. That was his, his thing that he needed done, and, and that was an engineering challenge for me. So I came in with a thought of how can we move the boat, where are we going to move it, the logistics, and that's logistics is where I shine. And then the job creep happened. The job creep. Now I became suddenly the welder to finish welding it. I had to have certified welders come in and finish the boat. So from just move the boat, it became finish the boat and move the boat. And all else that was involved with that. So the job creep expanded greatly. Did you, were you cool with that? When I commit to a project, I commit to a project. And I've lost my key welder over this. It's, 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 I've had other projects that I was going on. I stopped them. I own a paper mill up in Gardner. That project went totally on the back burner so I could get this, which was supposed to be a limited length project. And it's now an inf infinite project and so my mill is on hold that was going to be my bread and butter going forward this has been extreme negative cash flow yeah. and i'm supposed to be getting positive cash flow yeah. so I, financially this is the worst nightmare i could have 
Um, but I, I get nothing if I don't keep going. He built this beautiful pedigree boat, pounded the steel, ground the steel, did everything right. Neighbors tolerated it. And then a little legal glitch happened that turned the project upside down. Bickering with the town and neighborhood, and he signed a bad document. And the whole world, the house of cards is collapsed because he was forced to sign a false document. If I don't succeed, I lose huge. So it's an all chips are in situation. So you just keep putting more chips in. There's no, the, uh, failure is not an option. A lot of stress in my job. I had some loneliness back then. My kids were grown and gone, and I was divorced and alone. And so, so it, it happened at the right time for me too. So, yeah. It just worked. It worked really well for us for, for, for quite a while, and, and I could just be myself. I didn't have to wear my high heels. I didn't have to wear my bra. You know, I put a t-shirt on in the morning, went out and worked with them. Comb your hair, put it back. No lipstick. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. just, it was just a great relief for me, and, and it just, he just made me feel comfortable. And I wanted to help. I wanted to be there. And I saw it was his obsession, and, and it's something we had to do. I had to do if I wanted to be there. We had a couple issues. I think he kept looking for a girl to be in his... <laughs> I think he could have taken care of more than one woman, but that wasn't, that wasn't good for me. So that's why I'm such a peppy 77-year-old lady right now. And all I needed was a man. And I found a very interesting man when I met Harold's aunt. He is super. If he was in a lineup, I, I just couldn't have done better. Harold is a trumper. And he's, he loves Mr. Trump, the, our president, very much. And he adores everything that Mr. Trump does. I, on the other hand, do not feel that way. <laughs> he can live his life the way he wants it. But on the weekends, we get together and we're engrossed in each other. Yeah. Okay. This is the bedroom where Harold and I have fun. <laughs> this is why Harold loves to come to my house. He loves this bath, the shower. Isn't that nice? And uh, we shower together. And this, my husband had made special in India. And each of these little figures are doing it. <laughs> Intimacy is a significant part of uh, satisfying a basic need, a basic biological requirement. Uh, 
he's a wonderful fellow. And another thing is he says very loyal to his friends. Yeah, yeah. Either you love him or you hate him. Yeah, you love him because he's such a nice guy and he'll do anything for you. Yet a lot of the neighbors, he called them mass holes. A lot of people from Massachusetts, they hated him because his property looked so awful. You know, and he says, this is what nature intended it to look like. It, it's like a lot of things, you know, people move into a neighborhood and they um, have different expectations, you know. I mean, Harold was responsible for building this road, literally, because he wanted the school bus to come down for his kids. So he got a bunch of neighbors together when there were very few people who lived here year round. And he managed to get the, the roads built and negotiated with the town to get them. I mean, we wouldn't even really be this neighborhood without him in a lot of ways. Since he started the project, you know, there's been people who've come and they've bought houses here. Um, it used to be very inexpensive place to live and now it's a very expensive place to live. So, you know, people have invested money in big houses and um, being on the shore and, um, you know, they kind of dislike the fact that he's building something in their backyards. I, I really think it's just a different culture now than when he started. Um, and. Uh, One of, the, one of the shots that I'd like to have you, know, you can do is this little area right here. And then I want to tell you something about it afterwards. My green uh, green giant, which is cannabis. Yeah. And uh, I make that stuff. This is a rub. And this is the this is the end of your tongue tough stuff. But that was, that was all just sitting here normally. So all I do is put it in order and say, hey, that's kind of like me. <laughs> Well, it's kind of different because I've lived here for like 30 years. And the neighborhood has changed quite a bit in 30 years. Harold's probably started this boat probably, what, 26 years ago? 20, well, my daughter's 27, and I think that he put the first stays on the, for the hull on when my brother came to visit and she was just born. So, and, and like she's, no, she's 23, so she's 27. So, like, it's been 23, 24 years since, uh, you know, the boat has been built. So the neighborhood has really changed around here, and, and a lot of people never knew what was going on up that road. You know, the, most, most of the people that were around here, and there's probably not too many of us around, that have been around here the whole time, that the Harold's boat's been here. And, and I see it as a great project, because I'm, I'm a project kind of person anyway. So, so I, see, I saw it as a great project. Um, you know, it, it went through its phases with him going in, into being a um, nonprofit type thing. You know, that was kind of, kind of weird and stuff like that. But it was still just Harold's boat, and we always accepted it as Harold's boat. And Harold was a, an accumulator or a porter or whatever anybody wants to call him. You know, he was bringing stuff home to that still had use, that what he thought had use or what he could use or somebody else could use. So, like, I was always supportive of that. I mean, like I say, I, I have a, a touch of it myself, so I guess that. <laughs> it looks, looks a little different over here. But yeah. Well, you can't see it because of my trees across the street. <laughs> but no, that, that didn't phase me at all. Um, and, and I can't really see why people want to be, uh, why it concerns them so much. I mean, it, it's, like I said, I guess they, you know, they're, they're worried about values of their own place. I don't know if they're that worried about things like, um, you know, general safety or anything like that. I mean, you know, I don't know what would happen back there that, that you know, like kids will go back there and play, but kids are going to go back and play anywhere. You know, if there's anything dangerous back there, there's, I mean, there's a big old ocean out there with rocks and cliffs and everything else. I mean, there, there's danger everywhere, so I'm not too, too concerned about that kind of stuff. I, I raised two kids here. Um, it, the, the street was more dangerous than Harold's boat. <clears throat> Oh, almost everything. I was a research chemist. I worked in the theater doing lighting. I designed computer hardware and software. And then uh, the last few years before I retired, I was doing a, running a remodeling business, remodeling houses. So a little bit of everything. You do what you have to to stay alive in the state. 
shortest form of this is Harold was working at BIW, had access to a lot of material, brought it home, and his dream was to build a training boat for kids. So he started building, of course he's working pretty much alone, welded up this hull, got quite a ways along with it, ran out of money, uh, perhaps ran out of energy too, he was getting older, he's about as old as I am I think. Uh, and in order to keep the project going, formed a foundation. That put him in violation of assorted zoning things. And a few people called him on it. So he went to the town, he got a, I think the first extension was three years, then he got two more years, then he got another five years. Mm -hmm. Then he pretty much ignored the expiration of the extension and kept on going anyway. So it, it turned into a bit of a mess. I was on uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. They said, whatever you do, don't hit the mic. And I, at one point I went like this, and when I got a question right, I was oh my God, the poor people in the sound booth. But it's not uncommon for men to do this. I know it on a smaller scale. One of my friend's husbands built a boat in their garage and it was too big. They had to cut a hole in the <laughs> garage to get it out. He mismeasured it. Um, Another one of my friends, he put so many layers of fiberglass on it, it almost sank. You know, I think it's just the thing guys do. Yeah. He just did it on a grand scale. I don't know how many tons it weighs. And it's a hundred foot steel ship and his plans of getting it out. I was like, hey, with the, the Rube Goldberg pontoons and the, I'm like, Harold, I've stayed on that side of the point. There's not enough water. Oh, we got pontoons, we got a whole plan. I'm like, Harold, it's not deep enough. You're never gonna get that ship out that way. You know, so it's just there and it's, uh, you know, kind of like the Winchester house. It's a novelty now and I don't know what his plans are now to do with it. Slideshows. Chris, so come on. Living. He press, presents slideshows to Come on. Retirement communities, and that's what he's good at. Come here, um, Dee. Come, come on. on. Because it's Har we're doing it for Harold, Dee. Let's do it together. Chris, sit here. Yeah. is it okay to move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, you've been at everything, right? No, All right. no, no. But, no, no, yeah. no, no. Chris, you always have a wonderful way of looking. He's worried about her, what she's going to look like. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Okay. you got to remember. He sees things outside the box, obviously. Um, he's always positive. Whenever we would need something fixed or, or we would need something created out in his shop, God bless him, he'd fit it in. And he made a fire grate for us at camp mm -hmm. out of metal he got from Bath Iron Works, right? <laughs> it was probably metal from the leftover from the ship. But that's the kind of guy Harold is. If you were broken down the side of the road, he'd be the one to stop in a rainstorm. And that's why. It's so upsetting that he's gotten resistance and it just seems like he's been stopped in his tracks by people that I don't think understand quite. So Harold's one of those kind of people that is so far out in how he thinks about things. It's too far removed and I don't know how we could get the people who really don't like what he's doing. I mean, they... He, I'll guarantee you, he does things that we don't like. Okay, there's just too much trash back there. But I understand why Harold has it. And it actually is organized. I'll never forget when I first, I forgot about this. My son was a, wanted to lobster. So he just got a, had a boat and he would go out and he just would set five traps. So we had to get a license still to even do that, and he did that. But we needed something for him to pull the rope up on. And I went over to Harold and I said, Harold, we need something that will be like some kind of a roller or something like that. He knew exactly where to go, where to get the item, and made it for us to fit on the boat to do what we needed. And so there may look like that, but Harold knows where everything is out there and what it is. It's got some sense of order to it. Doesn't look like it to people, but he does. He knew where every nail and yeah. washer and screw was. Yeah, and what, what kind? They're all, jar. They're all in size. Yeah, it's not just haphazard. And the tragedy is because the boat project got slowed down, 
I think a lot of that stuff would have got used. Yeah. But it just sat there, and yeah. time has taken its toll, and now yeah. it's become junk. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's just un- it, it's just like a catch twenty two where everything has just kind of come together against the project and. It's hard to regain momentum again. It uh, really is. Yeah, we really want to see the boat launched. And that, that, that's the hard part, you know? It's like, and I'm sure you're sensing it with everybody. It's like, is apprehension because <laughs> people are out to get people and it's like, well, and you're just an observer. So um, that's, you know. <laughs> You're, you're not engaged with it at all. I got right out front in front of the front of the town, really, before I knew anything, you know? Yeah. Oh my God, I'll tell you though, they do this, they do this all the time. As you can imagine, the whole yard is filled. A lot of it is. And so over time, it's, everything is gradually sinking. And, and then there's drainage issues and there's all sorts of stuff, so. Yeah, uh, I'm Willie Leathers, um, and I'm a merchant mariner, um, shipbuilder, and uh, aquaculturist. Um, and throughout my uh, childhood, spent a lot of time sailing on the water. Turned that into heading up to Maine Maritime Academy uh, for a college education and licensing program. Um, worked in commercial tug and barge, and then got engaged in uh, sea education programs, both for high school and college uh, semester trips. Um, and I would say that a, a passion of mine is education at sea um, and working with youth. Harold and, and the group were looking for someone to help program the boat, and I was looking for a boat to help program. Um, so immediately there seemed to be a connection. Uh, it became very apparent right off the bat that the boat wasn't going to be sailing that summer. Um, and, you know, I quickly learned uh, just how much um, was into the story of why it was where it was. There was a sentiment that the boat was useless or didn't have a potential future and was hoping to connect the dots for that and be able to advocate for the fact that in actuality it was something that could have great usefulness um, and you know a wonderful design well built to that point had all the potential to move forward it wasn't just a piece of junk in the woods, so, yeah. And the thing is, is that he really now, he wants it to be an educational type ship. He wants it to make a maiden voyage to the Arctic. And he's positive that his design for that hull, which he invented himself, his design, is going to be able to break through ice. If I have my way, the first voyage that the boat will make will be to the Arctic with a class of 16 students, three professors or three researchers and a crew, and that'll be one of the first student activities into the Arctic to explore. But that's just my dream. So I wanted Based on that, I wanted something that would uh, ride up and over something it might hit. And whether it was a quail or a cargo container or a reef, I mean. So basically that's why the symmetry, it all comes together. And that's because the, the bow of that boat is way, way much stronger than it's supposed to be. Uh, but also in the uh, bow stem itself, that's actually two triangles. It's got a strong back and then a triangle both sides of it with a back. So it's like two triangles together and it's made out of half inch steel instead of the three-eighths that it was supposed to be. So it's 
25% thicker steel. That it's very, it was very, very difficult to bend and shape that, but it made a unbelievably strong bow stem. Then to bring all those longitudinals in against that bow stem, which was way stronger than it's supposed to be, and the longitudinals coming together were much closer, the whole thing became what we jokingly said was ice ready. And the AWS inspector said, yeah, this, this damn thing is, you know, like a tank. And it's, it's going to be way safe to take students into the, uh, into the Arctic. The reality is the ice cover in the Arctic is not what it used to be. And that's a indication that uh, climate is changing. Now, you, a tree hugger in mind is they don't base their opinion on or their presentation on the facts of biology. They they react emotionally to uh, things and suggest solutions that are biologically or financially or economically not uh, prudent. I, my background is marine biology, uh, aquaculture specifically. Uh, I taught that at Bowdoin. Uh, I practiced that in my early age. I realized that I was not going to make a lot of money uh, growing stuff. It's like a farmer. They don't make any money. They just have an existence. So I got involved in waste minimization through my association with BIW uh, and then did some consulting work after I left there, helping industry minimize their waste. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I'm an environmentalist. I'm a uh, waste minimization specialist is the title I use. And uh, uh, I get very much involved in not throwing stuff away. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I inject my opinion wherever someone will listen. I've lived outside the box forever. I joined BIW in 82, and it just so happened that the president of BIW, uh, Buzzy Fitzgerald, he and I were peers, and I waltzed into his office in a huff one day and said, you know, I could run a business on what this place throws away. And he said, go fix it. And that was my mandate. And <clears throat> for five years, I uh, reported to the boardroom uh, savings and earnings, $5.2 million the first year. And the last year that I was there and reported, which was 95, was $7.8 million. What an amazing brain he must have. So maybe there, there's a little piece here that's screwed up, but over here, Holy moly, it, there's a lot going on there, you know? He said to me one day, do you have a bug out peg? I said, what is a bug out peg? And he explained to me that, you know, it's a, a survival bag. Uh, no, that is not for me. You know, I am not that kind of a person. I am going to live in the moment, and if something should happen to the world, God forbid, I, I will probably croak within two or three days, like he said. <laughs> but you know what? I've had a good life. I have enjoyed my life, and I've enjoyed every single minute of it. I don't know if Harold truly enjoys living because he's always preparing for the worst. Always preparing for that day that he thinks is going to happen.
But a lot of times, I'd, if I, I'd open a cupboard and I'd see a uh, hundred of those uh, the, of those plastic containers, I'd say, Harold, what are you going to do with all of these? Throw them away. Oh, no, no, you never know what I might use those <laughs> in my ship. I might need those. That man would not throw away a straw. I, no, I don't think it's OCD. I think sometimes he was sort of mad at the world that we're not taking care of things and pretty soon it's going to be too late and I, I used to say to him, no, we're not going to get to that point where it's going to be too late. Somebody's going to take care of it. People just say, oh, we don't need to reduce. We don't. There's plenty of it, plenty of it. Well, it's plenty of it for this generation and maybe the next generation, but the next generation is going to be in deep shit. And uh, so, yeah, I'm concerned about the the ability of the human race to keep going uh, way into the future. Uh, yeah, local, local time, yeah, we're good. She forgot to show you the, the wild cranberry relish that, that oh. we make. Um, and you had some rosehip tea. Uh, but anyways, this is just a summary of, uh, it all started kind of in August 8, 1920, uh, 1992, when I uh, had a big ceremony here. But this shows, this was the early part of the major conflict. I had the same opinions and the same thoughts and the same bitches all through. The Island Rover Foundation became a nonprofit in July of the year 2000. After I got my application for the 501c3, then I um, petitioned the town uh, for a private school or school and I got I got permission to have a school but <clears throat> there was a town councilor that lived down here that didn't want the school down here but I started building the boat as an individual. They couldn't cite me for that because there's boats all over town. Uh, and it wasn't until I put the property out back into the name of Island Rover Foundation, they had the ability to use the zoning ordinance. They claimed I was industrially manufacturing in a residential area and that the fact that I had all this stuff, uh, that constituted a junkyard. Well, at the age I was, and with the financing I had, when they offered me a consent agreement, uh, I didn't see any reason that I couldn't and shouldn't sign it. But in hindsight, that I should never have signed it. Uh, about running a junkyard, about manufacturing in a residential area, <clears throat> and that because I'm in violation of those two, they put in there a requirement that I had to give up my school. So I signed it. Um, Do you feel like you just didn't read the fine print on it? No, I didn't understand. I didn't understand. One tiny little line right here says give up the school. And that's the whole reason Well, I really, I really appreciate you've chosen my topic to uh, do this. That uh, I'm, I'm finally getting a, an opportunity to tell the whole story and have somebody listen uh, to my, uh, uh, to my rendition. So. Fear has sort of, uh, within our culture, we attach negative 
judgment around it so people feel defensive if you say that they're afraid rather than just recognizing that it's a physiologic state of excitation and and whatnot that's sort of non-judgmental that it's just it is what it is it's like it's raining out instead of being sunny out i'm afraid instead of being feeling loving and creative it's just is uh, we have built a narrative around that that says that when someone's afraid there's something wrong with them that's unfortunate because it, it gets people to protect their fear rather than and defend it rather than meet it and so my sense is that that's what happened and the the story and the narrative that got created around this project the negative story was all done to reinforce that fearfulness that was sort of the basis of the whole thing and it was ludicrous because it was it the amount of energy the amount of stuff that was done and the sort of the amount of human endeavor that got thrown in to obstructing and blocking something and i remember they had a uh, an executive session with the council that night i was there with the town attorney and the town attorney essentially came in and says look you don't want to end up with a derelict boat right off the coast of Maine sitting there, or Freeport, sitting there falling apart. It'd be an eyesore. And that pretty much just swayed the council at that point. There wasn't much discussion. So they said, no, all right, let's just go ahead with this. So they took legal action. Which then had to be met with all kinds of creative endeavor to try and figure out how to get around those roadblocks. And it's like, so if all of that energy on both sides could have been focused on, oh, look at this. We got this guy did this really cool thing and he built this thing and he wants to get it in the water. How can we help? It, the boat would have been in the water five years ago and hundreds of thousands of dollars would not have been spent feeding lawyers and, and this whole thing. I mean, I get involved, one piece of my involvement is that, you know, Harold didn't have any money. And as a guy who by total accident of birth happens to have some, I've been paying his legal bills for the last five years. You know, not because I don't even really know him. Private, I guess not. I guess it, it suggests that I have an investment, but it's not an investment from, I don't expect to ever see that money again. There is an injustice happening here. There's a guy's being steamrollered, and he's being steamrollered by people who have access to money and power because they know how to play the game. I don't know. I, I mean, I truly don't know. And I, and I think that, that I, I think it's telling that, that, you know, certain folks on the council have, haven't talked to you because I th it's to this day, it's sort of puzzling to me. Why would you, why would you sabotage this project and sabotage the town's interest in, in furthering this project so it's no longer a burden on the town's taxes? So, you know, this this could have been resolved had there been some measure of cooperation, but everybody was like, no, not me, or I don't want to deal with it. So there was this collect, collective inaction resulted in, you know, this yeah. destroying the prospects of the project. But I don't, I, I don't know why. Um, and, and then I kind of have to backtrack a little bit because yeah. at the time, and I think this was after the consent agreement, the town wanted to know, all right, are there land use violations down there? Was a junkyard created? Uh, that type of thing by all the material he had down there. So I spent hours, a few days a week, for probably over a month going down there. And we cataloged every piece of material he had on his property. And Harold was in tow. Because the sticking point here was, well, if it was discarded material, discarded this, that, or the other thing, then it would be a junkyard. If he could prove he had use for all this material stored on his property, then it wasn't a junkyard. Yeah. And essentially, he was able to, uh, on paper, say that, yeah, he, he pointed out specific uses for all this material. And uh, so we had this documented list. and. His position was at this time, well, this is great, you know, okay, uh, for the town's purposes, okay, it's not a junkyard, and we made that determination.
Oh, I have a lot of understanding of that. Not through my marine experience, through living here. Where I grew up, that wasn't called a junkyard. That was just called a... You could even have called that a business where I grew up. Build a sailboat out of a pile of junk mentality. That's literally... I wasn't even talking about the Island Rover. That's literally the expression is you could build a sailboat from a pair of skivvies was the expression back in the 50s. And that was just a way of life up here. You just... You didn't throw anything away. You used anything you could. Um, no, I thought that was kind of expected and... and there are still a lot of parts of Maine where that's, that's the way of life. It's just not that way where the boat is anymore. It gets very convoluted, and the, the only people who might understand it are the lawyers. I'm afraid with all the hassles, the broken promises on both sides, that word's gotten around and nobody's going to, going to want to deal with this. You know, it's got too much of a bad odor hanging around it. No matter how worthy an objective, too much has happened. So, don't know. The town was thinking of what their different options were, and uh, you know they were imagining that certain things they would do would make you know make the problem of the boat being there become theirs, and they wanted to know what they could do about it. And I you know, looked at the condition the boat was in and all the stuff, and I made a recommendation that went to the manager, and I assume it went to the council, with, that said, basically, if this becomes the town's, they should just scrap the thing, cut it all up, and haul it away, because it wasn't worth much of anything at that time. Um, now I would say something different, that's right. Harold represents so many things that are attractive about Maine, his independence, his, his value of tradition, his desire to do things to better the world. Uh, and, it's, and it's not unusual to do what he's done in the 1800s and early 1900s. It just seems to be unusual to do it in, in now. But, but I think to your question, it, it, I think there is something in society that dismisses more now than it ever has done in my lifetime. Dismisses this idea that we can all get together and make something work. I uh, was out talking with her one day, roadside, and uh, we were about halfway through the pandemic, and uh, she uh, she looked at me. She said, "Harold, this pandemic hasn't hasn't affected you a bit. <laughs> you, your your lifestyle's the same as it's ever been." But. Uh, I told him I could never, ever live in his house, but I could visit periodically. I, and I'm not going to try to change him in any way whatsoever because he is interesting just the way he is. Uh, I got one more thing that uh, Denise talked with you about, and uh, she was saying that that I should communicate that it's not just her. Um, she, she talked to to you about her late husband, who uh, is communicating via electrical mm -hmm. means, turning lights on and off. Yeah. There's no question in my mind. And when I finish this, you'll see.
Cleaning that up is fun, isn't it? Yeah, I like destruction instead of construction. You, yeah. <laughs> you sound like you sound like my grandson. He's and he's he's the one that did these piles. And uh, he said, "You got some more stuff to break up, Grandpa." <laughs> yeah. Let me toss up shit, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me Know, was I unhappy to see some of this going? I, no, it's it's Mother Nature has reclaimed it. It's time for it to go. Cleaning up the site. It's a mess. I mean, anybody who was down there two weeks ago, I have a video of it. It looks like a junkyard. And that's not fair to the neighborhood or to that beautiful area along the coast. And I'm not sure Harold would call it a junkyard. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, objectively speaking, that's fair. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first object I had was to sit down with Harold and Carter Becker and the town council, none of whom like or respect or trust one another, and say, look, guys, uh, yell it to the neighbors to clean this place up. Ed Bradley uh, extended the olive branch to have the town help him through, you know, dump trucks and, uh, you know, removal equipment and employees and stuff to and, and a free dump pass for a lot of this, or what they call the transfer station. Um, but he just needed some assurances that nobody would, would basically sue each other for some sort of either trespass or personal injury or whatever. It was basically just a, a ceasefire. Like, let's just concentrate on getting some of this junk out. He, you know, when he'd signed things in the past, he'd been totally screwed. So here, here, here's his lawyer telling him, saying, listen, Harold, you know, this is, gonna, this is great for you. We're gonna you know, clean up some of this stuff and your daughters don't wanna have to deal with this, you know, what I would call crap in the woods, what you call treasures. He, I'm not signing that fucking thing. That's so sons of bitches. And, you know, and, so, and here I was coming to get him, coming to him and say, here, sign this, um, because you know, your woods are kind of full of crap, which, you know, is exceedingly insulting to him. So to, you know, to his defense, that's how it, that's how it felt. And, you know, to their credit, they sat down and started talking about how to do that. And there is a plan for cleanup. And in my understanding, as of a couple of days ago, that it's well underway and it, it could be completed within a reasonable degree of uh, satisfaction to all parties within a couple of weeks. Yeah. And then you hit second phase of the plan, which is, well, how do you launch this boat? I mean, from my perspective, <clears throat> the litigation is going to cost the taxpayers of this town roughly $100,000 to complete. And the, there are only two outcomes of that possible that I can think of. One is that we win um, and we own a boat we don't want, or we lose and we spend $100,000 we don't have. So I can't see any real uh, benefit to the taxpayer or the town uh, to litigate this. So I'm trying to find a solution. Um, I've approached this from the point of view of a litigation makes no sense. It's not in the interest of the town. And what is in the interest in the town is getting this boat launched. And that's what I'd like to see happen, but it's, it's a formidable challenge. It's, it's uh, um, both technically and politically. The emphasis on Island Rover has switched from being against me. It's now focused on inhibiting Carter from performing what he agreed he would perform for me because we'd given him part ownership of the boat to entice him to get it in the water. Yeah, so there, so there are four launch sites, right? So there's Zero Shore Drive that Carter Becker owns. There is the end of Shore Drive, which is that 
private launch area that's in that, um, in that subdivision. So that's site number two. Site number three was the Wolf's Neck Farm site, and site number four was the L.L. Bean Paddling Center. Um, so I, I should say the other characteristic that all four of these sites share is that um, that politically they each represent some other challenge, some unique challenge that the other one doesn't have. Carter spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on welding, equipment, um, labor, getting the boat to the point that it's, it's ready to go in the water. That's because of Carter. Carter saw this opportunity and he spent that money. So now the lawsuit alleges that by Harold tendering to him 75% of ownership of the boat, so he paid Carter, not in money, but in, in title, three quarters of title to the boat, and the town's lawsuit contends that he didn't do it for value, meaning he tried to shift it away to somebody as a way of getting out of, of the lawsuit with the town. The other lawsuit allows them to have title to the boat once he was found in contempt, and therefore they could cut it up if, they, if Harold and the Island Rover are the ones that own the boat. Yeah. But because he gave this away... Building a boat, he knew exactly what he was getting into. Politics and neighborhood... Um, that's in nobody's league. So there's your 30 second split. It's a canoe that got too big for the garage. Well, we are quite supportive of the Island Rover and um, the philosophy uh, behind the, the boat. Um, unfortunately, we are quite um, worried about uh, where it will be launched. Um, we're concerned that here on our beautiful Shore Drive, um, it's not the right area or location for the uh, rover to be um, placed in the water. So we're, we're quite concerned. Um, you know, the, this area is, 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 is quiet and um, really just a residential place. And so our children, you know, play all the time. Uh, near the potential uh, proposed launch site, and we're afraid um, it actually will be somewhat dangerous for them to continue to play nearby there or even on our block. Uh, it might get more, a lot more congested and uh, could be um, not, the, the flavor of the neighborhood could change pretty dramatically. It just, it won't fit. Um, we look, we did some measurements. We had, came out with ropes, looking at the width of the boat, and we walked the entire path through the road. And we measured it out. The boat would not make any of these turns without taking down a bunch of trees, which are on town land. And town said, oh, we'll take the trees down. Of course, the neighbors didn't like that idea. The other part of the problem is that he has no legal right to use that right of way. That right of way is a deeded thing. That's where the right to use the right of way starts for people on this side of the street. Yeah. So it's, they've got no legal right to use that would have had to take down a bunch of trees, including... The boat is too long to make that turn. They would have to actually sculpt out the, the person's yard in order to make the turn. Wow. And not just sculpt it out, they'd have to get a bulldozer in and bulldoze the hill around to get it out. And he's run into real issues. And, and they're almost insurmountable. Of course, we wanted to see it launched. And that has not come close to happening, so... There was some interest in getting it launched down in, in this neighborhood, which I don't understand that would seem like an engineering feat to me, given that at low tide, there's basically no water here between, between um, Lower Flying Point and Wolf Snack. It's, it's totally clam flats out here. Yeah. Um, and that's a, what is it, 130 foot? It's yeah. a good size piece of steel that I'm sure draws a fair amount of of, of water. If he has that owner's permission to build a ramp, 
yeah, but that's a tidal bay. Um, and it's in mud flats most of the day. Uh, when it's not in mud flats, it's about two feet deep, maybe three at the most. And as far as I know, that boat draws more than that. So you would have to actually dredge out that bay in order even to get the boat to float. Even on a spring tide, you'd either have to dredge or find some way. A big barge maybe, and I don't know if a big barge can get far enough up in the cove, and you'd still have to crane it, and there's no place to crane it from. I mean, it gets pretty messy pretty quickly. It's just a matter of time until she goes in the water. It's, it's, it's simple engineering. It's putting it on a bunch of tires and driving it to the water and floating it away on airbags. We don't need a lot of water. We just need to get it to the water and then let the extra flotation float it. So there is no destruction, there's no massive, you know, oh, it's gonna drag through the mud. No, it's not. That's what airbags are for. I mean, we, we sh launch destroyers at Bath Ironworks the same way. We move them around on the same dollies. We launch ships in, around the world on airbags. So this is not new technology. This is standard operating procedure around the world. It's just that it's happening in Freeport where it doesn't happen every day. But he never, to the best of my knowledge, called like a neighborhood cocktail party or something to sell the idea. Yes, I think it would have helped. Would it have been successful? That's pretty iffy. But it certainly would have smoothed things over a bit. Uh, instead, what he did was, I own the property, I can do whatever I damn well please. Zoning be damned, rules be damned. Went into the town council and told the town council, because I was at the meeting, several meetings, that they didn't know what they were talking about, they didn't understand their own ordinances, da 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 da. And even his own lawyer kind of shut up at that point because the town council knew exactly what their ordinance was. My specialty is in moving things that are too big to move by standard means, I guess. Okay. So my, my involvement or interest in the project was really, I came in as a, somebody to provide solutions to move the boat from where it is uh, to the water. Well, there's two primary means of launching it. The biggest difference being you can either move it in one piece or you can move it in pieces. But that's consistently, in my understanding, the backup plan for this is that if you were to, if the owners were to be forced to move it and not allowed to move it in one piece, that is the remaining option. The, the problem with it is the boat, uh, in its current condition, still has a, a significant value. I mean, this is not a, a small amount of effort or material. This, this is the combination of both into something that could be worth a significant amount of money. You know, and that uh, town has no interest in that, in, in taking the boat for that purpose. You know, it, it's, it, it just shouldn't own it. Um, that's what will happen if the litigation goes forward and the town wins. My guess is if that happens, the town in rapid, rather, rather, rather rapid fashion will cut it up and sell it for scrap.
So when the Wolf's Neck Farm Board said no to Carter and Harold's proposal with B.J. Grendel and Maine Coast Marine to launch the boat over their property, that, um, that basically cut off the final plan to keep the boat intact and you know, travel over the roads and, and get it into the water. So that, that we were suddenly out of options because that just was a decisive end to that proposal. Let's just listen. Let's listen to this guy, McDonald. You, you know, don't tell me as your lawyer about all the problems it has. Tell him. He's the engineer. You're the one that built this thing. You guys get together, talk about this. What, is, what would it look like to do this? Took a walk in the woods and look what you found. A bunch of hoodlums. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Twain. Twain, John McDonald. Hey, nice to see you. Good to see Thanks you for everybody. being here. Happy to be here. You met this craft? I have. Good. All right. Just stick we, with we, introductions. We, yeah. Yeah. So, so John, I, I think as I as I said to both uh, both Harold and not so much Carter because his lawyer is just basically the magic's got to happen with you guys. So. I'm just here to stay out of the way, and, okay. and uh, so you guys should just feel like you're doing what you're doing. And, okay. um, and uh, Bill's good friends of Carter and smart guy in the maritime industry, and um, you know he's welcome to participate too. So we're very much a listening session. Whatever you guys want to talk about is great. Um, so. What what is what is the basic thing we want to talk about? So um, I'll let you guys speak for yourselves. I think one of the things that John had talked to me about is. Um, the possibility of cutting the boat into pieces and reassembling it elsewhere, and whether that's feasible. Um, that's something he had talked about. Um, when this most recent plan to bring it over Wolf's Neck fizzled and died, um, we thought, all right, well, what's next? Um, so that's all this is, just a chance to consider that possibility amongst uh, you guys. Google's the line. Google's right. crack. You got to go up them. Okay. Uh, and the, it's a three six stitch weld, so three inches of weld, six inches of gap. Am yep. I thinking about that right? Yeah, on both sides, alternate sides of, of longitudinals and frames. Okay. You would you you do have a risk of residual stress. I, I mean, oh yeah, it yeah. would be something. So obviously, how, how many um, watertight Three. bulkheads do you have through Two. the ship? One right there and one back here. Whitest point. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go sit on that log over there because I can't stand. Well, let's keep talking. Um. Yeah. Now come, come forward some more. Right there. Right there. Okay. Again, this is all imaginary. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta give you the latitude. I'm, I'm shooting from the hip here. Yeah. But if I were to sit down with a napkin. I would actually take forward of the forward bulkhead, a horizontal slice all the way through, aft of the after bulkhead. A you know, you'd almost be adding a patch to hold the length, or you decide you're going to give up on an inch of length and fare in those sides by trimming back each longitudinal, faring them in and pulling them in. Hell, it's not going to be to the accuracy that it is here. It won't be. Okay, I, that's where I draw the line. It's either going to go back the way, exactly the way it is, or it's a no-go. That would be a very, you could do it. Like I said, you'd be patching a lot of longitudinals in shell, but I agree, it would be expensive if you want it exactly like this. And all for politics. I won't comment Here, on let's, the let's politics. Suckle there. Okay. You know, he, he's a, he's a well, smart not, guy, you okay. guys are smart guys. Can okay. it be done? He, he said yes, you said yes, but I, I think this is an opportunity to kind of roll it over in the dirt and consider the possibilities, so. But he, you want to he's because, because this won't fit over the road as as you can. Correct. So and, and four tenths of a mile. There's a beautiful property already picked out as launching range. Okay. I bought it partially for this use. Okay. But it's a political problem to let us use it. Ed is adamant I can't use my property to launch it on. I, I will avoid all the politics of it. <laughs> so, but engineering-wise, you talked of wheels and driving. It's already on just the way you do it at BIW. We've already driven it from there. 
to there with wireless remote hydraulic wheels and it's all scheduled to go that way. See these? See these so we have right here? alternatives to slicing it up. We just have to outlive the politicians. Let, let me say on record, yeah. no. is, it, is it feasible to take it apart and put it back together again so that it is okay. as it is now? I, I'm uh, Yes, we build ships. Well, no, but I understand. But with and, the te with the tensions and, and all the stuff that are in this, so, okay. So, and this is this is what we talked about. That's the um, question. There is, can, are, can this be done? There are in beautiful, look. beautiful. Because <laughs> that was what I was afraid that somebody from BIW could easily be that type of person, know, and yeah. and Ed Ed Bradley would grab that and. Well, right, Jordan, we're not being filmed, are we? Okay. No, yeah, shut it out. Shut it down. Um. No, there's no remote for it. It was working. The camera don't work. It crashed. It's it's a guy just gave it to me. I need a guy that needs that cares for him. That's okay. They will either ride or walk. I'm, I'm, we're heading to Shore Drive. What? We're heading to Shore Drive. Is that where we're going? That's where we're going. Okay, party. Because, because if he, because, because it's the balance scale of, of, of justice. I understand. I understand. If he finds it better to do one than the other. <coughs> There was a house here in 52. That's a whole different... Okay, I'm not gonna open we, we, we won't even go there. The town's pulling every card there is to get in the way. Now we can either walk down the gully or walk down a different, uh, easier way. The, the few townspeople I've spoken to aren't, aren't against the project. No. I'm just risk of risk. Yep. So here you are, you're coming out right here. Because there's the crappy tree and the big pines. You're coming out right through here. Only about 20 feet beyond the marsh right there, it's half tied. Boom, so the, the, the pitch, you have to add a little here, cut a little there, and you're there. We're not, we're not the... allowed the time, the luxury of time to finish the boat where it is. Yeah. We gave up that right in essence to appease the town we only did what it took to make it watertight to put it in the water programs that are uh, involved in Arctic expeditions or want to be. And I made a commitment that day that if I was thinking that the thing would be launched in a couple of years, but that's how we've gone by. But, okay. but that was the first, the, there is, a, there is a, a document out there that uh, shows that we are capable of going to the Arctic with that because uh, right now in its structure, it is ice ready. It's been declared ice ready. Wow. Because as I explained, it'll okay. go up and over. Yeah. She's beautiful. She's a beautiful boat. So. Harold, you, lot of, you gotta let this man get out and go and have his supper. He's late for dinner. Late for dinner? You, or gotta, my... you gotta let him out. Oh, okay. The I, last one in. I can do that. I, I can do that. I want my wife dancing with other people. <laughs> as we discussed. So, I better get on the road. I, I, I think, I think, 
truly the difficulty of a of disassembling the ship or cutting it up or taking it out of there in any other way is one a shame and two anyone who thinks that that is an easy task is is misguided you know it's it's substantial um, and and so I think that in reality if you were to look and say wow we have all the money together to cut this thing up and take it out of here in pieces doesn't that equal the same energy and money to take it out of there in one piece and and what a shame that would be to lose both the the energy and ingenuity that's been put into it as as just a, a, a piece but then just the example of saying we're gonna do this we're gonna you know we're gonna destroy something that has all the potential when we have the option to do one or the other because it, it really is equal it's not that there's an easy answer of removal through destruction that, that it's it's just as difficult if not more I, from the neighbors I've spoken to, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who you've spoken to, but uh, yeah, they're they're done. Do you know what I mean? They really want it gone get it out or at least put it on his property so it's not blocking that cut through. You know, uh, other people consider him a folk hero. And uh, it's really difficult to, you know, get, get mad at Harold. Deep down inside, I believe that what success I had was, yeah, I stood alone a lot, but I had this deep-seated belief that there was something behind me. Yeah. And, you know, I served in three tours in Vietnam. It's clearly some of that stuff behind me wasn't very good. Yeah. The fact that Harold can still at this point recognize that there's something special in what he is and what he's doing tells me it's pretty honest. It wouldn't have survived this test that he's been through if it, if it wasn't honest. Yeah. And I think that's part of my worry for many young people do feel if they don't toe the line, if they don't belong to this group or that group, they won't be safe and they won't be special. By all appearances, one person should not have been able to do what Harold did, marshalling the resources and whatever else that he was able to do, so absolutely. I mean, unfortunately for Harold, I mean, he's now close to 80 years old and he's lost these, these productive years of his retirement life to, to build not just the thing itself, but the the um, the intangible the school the uh, you know who knows what could have happened had had the boat been finished and you know he was able to sail it um, you know he only would have been in his uh, late fifties early sixties then um, and he would have had a lot of good years to build whatever it was and so I think it's heartbreaking to him um, to think about what could have been and what he could have enjoyed not just the building of it but to see that you know that feeling of of you know, young people and students just sort of getting inspiration and joy out of this thing that he had built. Um, I, I'm sure it's just, a, it's, it's probably the, 
you know, it's probably the greater tragedy of the two that he couldn't get to experience that because of the animosity of, of um, the relations with the town. One of those magazines, or one of those newspapers, uh, accused me of being eccentric. And I thought, that's the best goddamn compliment I've ever had. <laughs> and I was telling Denise the other day that I remember that. And she says, well, you are. <laughs> and I says, I know I am, but that's, that's part of who I am. Right now, I'm focusing on leaving behind, uh, when I pass, uh, something that's going to be of use to future generations, which is the School Bus Archive Library. And like I said, this 500 books of which are uh, all focused on the topics of my life, and there's 15,000 documents that are going into those filing cabinets, and it's all going to be in one place. That's it. A box of books. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm of the opinion that when this country collapses, which it's, not, it's already starting to, when it goes kaput financially, uh, climate change, whatever, uh, the heirs, the future uh, people living part of the country are going to need information uh, on how to grow stuff and how to butcher animals and how to do all that kind of basic stuff that was common knowledge back in the 1800s. But uh, it's all preserved in many books that are in there that are that old. Uh, I've got cookbooks that are in there that tell you how to uh, take a live animal and do everything you need to it to present it on the table at a meal. As a biologist, I view the work I view the world differently uh, than a religious person. Uh, we have weight. We have mass. We have the fact that, and these are these are physics laws. You can't. You don't. Uh, create or destroy matter or energy, you simply change the state, change the form. Um, when you burn something up, you change its mass, but you create all these other things that are, that still have weight. But we can't we do not have, as a society or as a uh, culture, a definition for what life is. Uh, or where life comes from. Or when it stops. And if and when it dies. We have words that yeah. supposedly describe what we're trying to talk about. We, we have physicists out there that are still uh, can't give you or can't give anybody a real definition of a concrete, scientifically provable definition about a lot of things. I'm convinced that life is just another I don't know what to call what to call it, but it's another entity 
like mass and weight and light. What 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 am, what am I what am I taking in that's stimulating the nerves that allows me to sense light and see objects? And I think that life is just another parameter. That's the word I want. Another parameter that we we can't explain. We do not have a definition for it. In fact, uh, I've had enough experiences with. Uh, outside, uh, some people call it the other dimension. Uh, and there's not just one other dimension, there's a lot of other dimensions. That television up there uh, turns itself on and off. Yeah. <laughs> so. See, I'll come out in the middle of the night and yeah. it's, it's not connected to anything. Uh, the really interesting thing was that when her fiancé came, um, he had had a fish that had a battery in it that um, squawked. So when he came, she lived on second floor in a house that she owned. And so when he showed up sometimes, uh, the fish would squawk, but the fish had no batteries in it. Uh, and then we'd feel the breeze. The funeral's going on, and they called in the electrician because something was wrong, and he found no problem, but the, li the lights kept flashing. Um, my grandson uh, passed at the age of six, which is 10 years ago, and he still communicates um, with his mom through butterflies and rainbows, and she has seen more rainbows in the last 10 years than it's a it's amazing, right? In the sunny sky, and there's no rain in sight. And she's the only one that sees them. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes she, well, I say she's the only one that sees them. She's probably, many times she's alone when she sees them. But so there's no confirmation that other people are seeing them.